Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to see all of you here this morning. I guess everyone found out they already had all the Christmas decorations put up, so you can come <laughs> back today. Now, we appreciate that. I do want to begin today with a very special note of appreciation to everyone who helped to decorate the sanctuary for Christmas. It is absolutely beautiful. I walked in here the other day, and everything is... Everything really speaks to that celebration of Christmas, that celebration this time of the year. And so we are very, very richly blessed. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, though. We are very richly blessed, and again, thanks to all of you. It is very much appreciated. And I, I probably, it's probably a good thing I didn't decorate for Christmas. If anyone ever sees my Christmas tree, you'll know why it's a good thing. But today is also a very special day to me. Uh, today marks my fifth year as your pastor. Yay! Yay! I wasn't expecting a round of applause. Okay? There will be a special collection. But, uh, yeah, you pay us. I should pay you. <laughs> Oh, you can feel the love. This is why these five years have been so special. <laughs> now, the reality is, five years ago, I walked into this congregation not really knowing what to expect. I mean, I had served here and doing what they call pulpit supply. I'd come in and preached, and uh, I was really impressed with the awesome job that they did uh, in the absence of a pastor that's tremendous and well beyond the expectations yes. of a church council chair or a lay leader. So the reality is, I walked in not knowing what to expect. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and boy, was I surprised. <laughs> no, I, I found this community to be a very welcoming, friendly, I think of all of you now as family. Uh, the five years have not always been perfect, but we've made it together. We've gone through tough times. We've lost good friends. We've had to deal with some very difficult situations. But here's the beautiful thing. We are all still here. We all still call Salem United Methodist Church our home. We all still are filled with hope that this congregation will continue. As I often say, it is never about the pastor. It never is. It's about how God works in a congregation. And when you consider the fact we are in our 180th year of service and mission and gospel-centered worship, you have to ask yourself, how did this church survive when so many churches do not? Every year in the United Methodist Church Indiana Conference, we close more churches than we open. This church has prevailed through war, depression, pandemic, epidemic, all kinds of hardships, but it has prevailed. And think about this. With few exceptions, every Sunday morning, since 1844, people have gathered as Salem Church. People have gathered as Salem Church to thank God, but more importantly, to listen to God. And that's why we are here, and that's why I'll continue. So as I enter into my sixth year here, I do so with uh, great hope and great expectation for what we will accomplish next year, and also with a real sense of gratitude to each and every one of you. The beauty of this congregation and I can't recall who said this. I believe it or not, I think it was Adam. I, I think it was Adam. And I, I rarely quote Adam, but uh, in my book, a famous Adam you quote. You taking a chance. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I think it was Adam that said, it might have been about the, the Heritage Day this year, that when something needs to be done, everybody in this congregation pitches in and makes it happen. And that is probably the truest statement that anyone has ever said about Salem United so I am grateful for the five years that I've been here, and I look forward to continuing to serve and this congregation continuing to thrive. So thank you very much. Also today, this is the beginning of the Advent season. And in just a few moments, we're going to be lighting our first Advent candle. It's the candle of hope. And as we do that, though, today, I would like us to think just a bit about all those things in our life we've hoped for over the years. Think about all we've hoped for. 
We, when we're growing up, we hope for just that perfect Christmas present we've wanted for months. We hope, as we get older, we hope to do well in school. We hope to find the perfect person for a relationship. We hope to get that job we want. All of those things that we hope for. And then ask yourself, how many of those things have really come true? How many of those things that we hoped for have really materialized? Or at least in the way that we did. Because you see, we as human beings have a very limited definition of hope. Our definition of hope is that it's always tied to circumstance. It's always tied to something about us. Something to make us feel better, make us happier, make us, make us more comfortable with our life. But indeed, the question we're going to ask today and each day of Advent as we look at these different aspects of God's kingdom, what does God hope for? Think about that. What does God hope for in your life? What does God hope for in the way we relate to one another? What does God hope for in the way that we serve God? What is God's hope? And in that case, hope becomes a power, not an emotion. That's the message we're going to have today, and that's the message with which we will begin Advent. But as we gather today, let us begin as we do each time the good people of Salem United Methodist Church gather with this powerful affirmation, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad, glad in it. it. We do have a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Penny, uh, poinsettias? Yes, there's order blanks on the credenza. Uh, I need the orders by next Sunday, please. All right, very good. Also, we are in need of a coffee hour host or a hostess for next week the 10th, so I would ask all of you to pray about that. And going forward, going forward, uh, we want everyone in this congregation to look at some form of ministry. Age is no barrier, experience is no impediment. You don't have to be a seminarian to, to serve the church. God calls us all to serve. So we are in need of people to serve as liturgists. We are in need of people for a coffee hour, friends and family, that'll begin in February. All of these ministries of the church <coughs> call out for people to step up and be part of ministry here, and I encourage you to do that. So let us, now that we have gathered with the burdens of our life as we walk through these doors, let us remember that here we are to feel the love and the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ that rises above circumstance, rises above, above burden. Uh, so let us extend with one another a sign of that peace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Judy. Hey. <laughs> Before we enter into our call to worship, we're going to light the Advent candle of hope. And I'd ask Dwight and Sharon to come forward and light the candle. Do we have our lighting, or are you intending on rubbing two sticks together? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dwight would like to share with you a few stories from his life. <laughs> now, the, um, the Advent candle of hope symbolizes just what I was talking about. It symbolizes God's hope. And God's hope is not simply about waiting for a new day, a, a, a new change. God's hope is, a, is about a call to action. God's hope is about waiting in ways that serve and create God's kingdom. So as we light this first blue candle, it is symbolic of the power that God gives us to hope and the power that God gives us to wait with confidence and to be part of building God's kingdom. Thank you. Let us pray. Holy and living God, we light the candle of hope today, a sign and symbol of the power that hope gives us. We know that it is a gift for you from you bestowed onto each one of us, so that we may serve in the work of building your kingdom by the words of our lips, labors of our hands, and the acts of compassion. We pray that this light of this candle may symbolize the light of hope that must burn in each of our hearts, and even in moments of despair and struggle and pain and suffering, 
May that hope continue to cause us to walk forward to knowing that your grace overcomes all obstacles, your love overcomes all hatred and disunity, and your peace fills every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Let us now be about the reason we are here this morning as we join in our call to worship. Please stand if you're able for our call to worship. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. And then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Please join us in our opening hymn. It is so good to start to hear these seasonal songs again. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, page 211. We'll do all four verses with an introduction. take time to talk about how God works in each of our lives, and particularly during this season of Advent. It is a time when we need to stop and reflect upon that, and I am as guilty as everyone when it comes to walking through this life and not stopping to recognize how much God is sustaining me, how much God is guiding me, and how often I don't listen. And the reality is... We sometimes talk about God in ways that make it seem as though God is this distant, this distant being that we have to plead with. We have to plead with for mercy or good things or hope or all of those things. But indeed, God dwells with each one of us. The key is how open is our how open are our hearts to that indwelling of God through God's Holy Spirit. And my joy today, as you may suspect, is I'm celebrating five years as your pastor. Uh, normally, when you walk into a church, you are told that uh, you probably have three years, the way things are this day and age. But after five years, I can truly say I find great hope in this congregation, and I mean that very seriously. I find great joy in the people of this congregation. And you know, that joy is not based on numbers. Unfortunately, sometimes in the world of religion and church, we base everything on numbers. It's not based on numbers. 
it's based on the way that people in this church care for one another this is a church that takes very seriously the idea that pastoral care is a common ministry and we do care for one another in in every way possible and so i appreciate that and that is my joy this morning also today our sanctuary light is very special our sanctuary light today is in meant to memorialize naomi Rakowski and her mother pauline moore they were very very close in life and now united in god's light and love uh, i only came to know naomi when she was ill that was during the last few years of her life but I, can, I will always remember the beautiful eulogy that her daughter-in-law gave at her service. Spoke to a woman of great strength and a silent strength, great love of family and great hope. And I know a person who was so dedicated to this church and so dedicated to the mission of Salem United Methodist Church that that must live in each of our hearts. And I know that 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 commitment to faith, that commitment to compassion, to love, and to service. And I know all of you no doubt have wonderful memories of Naomi and the life that she lived. I am certain, though, that in large measure that came from Pauline, her mother. Came from Pauline, who was with Ray and Naomi for a number of years after suffering an illness. But that strength doesn't just come. It comes through your family. It comes through how God works in other lives. So today, as we memorialize Naomi and Pauline, let us look to their lives as what it means to love, what it means to care, and what it truly means to say, we are family. And as we walk forward from this place today, if there are struggles in our life, if we are struggling with things, if we are facing challenges we may not see an answer to, let's think of Naomi and think of Pauline. And even in Naomi's final illness, how there was a strength and a silent hope and a quiet joy. And so we memorialize them today. Also, we have a couple birthdays. On, uh, on Friday, Tony Fonts Jr., or the second, we should say, celebrates his birthday. And tomorrow is Casey Fonts' birthday. Your family does it all. I like the planning. Put it all, you know, get it over in, the, in like four days. Yeah. <laughs> That is, that is awesome. Any other joys and concerns? My great joy is seeing, uh, not yet, Judy. Were you raising your hand? Okay, no, sorry. I'll tell you when it's time, okay? <laughs> All right. All right. I was going to say, it's so good to see Karen, Karen. Yes. with us today. Yes. Absolutely, Karen. It's good to see you and Ed and, and Peggy and Lloyd, you're back. That's awesome. We appreciate that. She's in trouble. Yes, it's, it's good to see all of you. Good to see all of you here today. And Gretchen, once again, welcome. It's a, by the Bears have the day off, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, very good. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Other joys and concerns today? Yes, Adam. It's great to see our wanderer, Ed, come back to us. <laughs> Get broke and tie him up a little bit. <laughs> Okay, uh, we probably don't want that going out over the airways. Oh. <laughs> we are, we're roping and tying up people to keep them in the hey, Attendance is... It keeps them listening, waiting. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Adam, for always adding that air of anticipation. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yes, Judy. Oh, okay. My turn. Uh, yes. <laughs> Gotta wait till Adam's done. So, okay. uh, Mary is having a biopsy done, and regardless of the outcome, she has to have a gland removed. Ooh. Okay, we'll so pray for Mary. And when is she having that done? She doesn't know. Okay. She's in the process of, between Chicago and okay. and Munster. We will pray for Mary. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Anyone else this morning? Yes, Laura. Um, I asked for uh, prayers last week for a 22-year-old uh, girl by the name of Kelsey, mm -hmm. and uh, she has been in a coma. Oh wow! And um, it just like happened overnight, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's been several weeks. But she did wake up on Thursday. Oh good. And um, they're attributing it 
that it was a diabetic coma. Oh, wow. But she did not know she had diabetes. Wow. So, but she has woken. So that's, that's great. great. We'll pray for Kelsey. Anyone else today? If not, let us center ourselves in the presence of a loving God who knows all challenges we face, all joys we feel. Holy and living God, on this first Sunday of Advent, we pray that you may fill us with that power of hope. We pray in thanksgiving that you call us to be your people, for you are our God. We are thankful for those of our congregation who have joined with us this morning. We thank you for the healing for Peggy and Lloyd. We pray that your healing presence may continue to be with them. We pray that your presence may be upon Karen, strengthening her and Stan and granting her hope. We pray in thanksgiving for Naomi Rakowski and, and Pauline Moore. We thank you for their lives of faith, of compassion, of family, and of love. And may they stand as example and witness of how to live out your mission of true discipleship. We pray in, in thanksgiving for Tony Fonts Jr. and Casey Fonts as they celebrate birthdays that they may continue to stand in powerful testimony of your love and your hope and what it truly means to be family. We pray for, in thanksgiving for Kelsey, we pray now that your hand will be upon this young woman as she continues to recover and continues to, to grow in faith. We pray in thanksgiving for Salem Church. May we continue to be a vessel of your love, a beacon of your justice, and a place of fellowship and gospel-centered service. And we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, in these days of Advent hope, we are reminded of your enduring faithfulness. Amid the darkness of a broken world, the light of your grace will once again awaken our souls. Yet we so often fail to recognize the power that your hope provides. We are bound by the language of death and despair. You are our merciful God. Forgive us for the hardness of our hearts. Restore us to carry the message of good news to all people everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into a time of stillness. And I was reading this morning an article that talked about what it truly means, what it truly means to be still before God as a part of prayer. And we really think about that. We think of prayer as standing here and talking to God and, and lifting all of these things to God and then, then wanting God to do what we are asking God to do. But in reality, <clears throat> stillness is the beginning of true prayer. Stillness is the way in which we experience God. We feel God surrounding us. And in that stillness, we lift those burdens of life. In that stillness, we lift those concerns and challenges we may feel. We simply experience God in ways that comfort, in ways that strengthen, and in ways that sustain. And today, as we go to that time of stillness of our minds, stillness of our lips, and stillness of our souls, I want you to concentrate just on this word of hope. Don't think about it. Don't try to explain it. Don't come up with a definition. But I want God to tell you right now in your heart what God hopes for you. What does God hope for you? Not just for you personally, but what does God hope for you to do in God's kingdom? What does God hope for you to do right now? So let us center ourselves in stillness. Place hope in our heart. And let God speak.
we should each and every day open our hearts to that message. That indeed it is what God hopes in our life, not what we hope that gives us power. And it's what God hopes in our life that sends us forth into this world to do God's service, to do God's mission, to build God's kingdom. And it gives us a whole new perspective on this word of hope. So we join now in what we call prayers of the people. And prayers of the people remind us of how we use the power of hope, the power of peace, the power of joy, and the power of love to build God's kingdom right here, right now. Please respond to our prayer. Holy God of enduring grace and mercy, may the church of your Son be an advocate of hope, a beacon of justice, a light of truth, and a place of reconciliation, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Salem United Methodist Church, in our 180th year of gospel-centered service, to continue to be a place of fellowship, a place of mission, a place of love, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayers. prayers. For all who during this time of Christmas expectation suffer from food insecurity, from any form of illness, from doubt, from despair, financial hardship, that the church may stand as an active partner with you in bringing hope, in bringing sustenance, and in bringing love to all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For the victims of war in the Middle East and in Ukraine, to be comforted by your healing power, and may your hand move in those areas bringing forth acts of compassion, acts of generosity, and calling forth the leadership of this world to seek peace, not war, unity, not division. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayers. prayers. For our first responders to know their task is sacred, that they may be protected and sustained by your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayers. prayers. For those who suffer the agony of grief, those who suffer physically, those who suffer the bondage of addiction, that your church may be a place of healing, a place of hope, and a place of welcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayers. For those prayers residing in the depths of our hearts, in the depths of our soul. For there is despair, grant hope. For there is fear, grant peace. For there is suffering, grant joy. And where there is pain, grant love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. And we lift all of these prayers to you in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. We now bring forward our offering. Please stand for the doxology. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 64 verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. 
For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please stand if you're able for this morning's gospel reading. <coughs> this morning's gospel comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone watch. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Probably you're wondering, like many people do and like most pastors do when we first start out in this vocation, why we would have a reading like this on the first Sunday of Advent. After all, you look around at all the decorations and the banners and all of the things that say be joyful. And we have the banner saying hope and peace and joy and love. And yet, here we have Jesus giving this very apocalyptic version, this eschatology, if you will, about, about the end of the world. But you see, there's something else in this reading, and that's why we have it during the first Sunday of Advent. And we have to go back and understand why Jesus is saying what he's saying and who he is saying it to. Prior to this text, what happens is that Peter, James, John, and Andrew, disciples, are sitting with Jesus. And they say to Jesus, they say to Jesus, isn't that temple beautiful? Isn't that temple wonderful? It's been built where God lives. And Jesus begins to tell them that it's going to be destroyed. That temple's going to be torn down. And then they ask the question everybody asks, and everybody wants an answer too, but there is no answer. They say, when is this gonna happen, Jesus? When is the world gonna be made right? When are things going to be made the way that, that they should be, that the Romans won't be here, that we'll be free, there'll be no more poverty, <clears throat> exploitation, suffering, famine, anything like that. When is that gonna happen? 
And Jesus gives them an answer they don't want to hear. Because he tells them that nobody knows. Nobody knows the time, the date, the hour. And we can get so caught up in saying, oh, we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen in this year. It's going to happen in that year. It's going to be the end of the world. Since Jesus Christ walked this earth, or since Jesus, the historical Jesus, walked this earth, people have been waiting for his return. And Jesus is giving us a very simple message in this. Now, I don't know how many people have family members who spend a, a significant amount of time trying to figure out when the world is going to end. Okay? This may, this may surprise you, but my Aunt Jean was one of those people. And she had it down to a science. Now, according to Aunt Jean, the world was supposed to end at least five times, and it didn't. No. She was one of those people that had those food preparation things so she could have enough food to last through the rapture. And she would say, don't worry. When the world ends, you can come to my basement. And I'm, I'm not living in your basement, Aunt Jean. You know, it's bad enough when you cook stuff that's fresh. I'm not eating food 25 years old, right? But the reality was, that's how she viewed it. That was her hope. She said that, that there would be those who would be taken away and those who would be left behind. Now, in her version, if you were taken away, that meant you were a good person. And if you were, were left behind, that meant you were in big trouble. Now, other people interpret it differently. They thought those left behind are here for God's new heaven and new earth, and those taken away are the ones in trouble. But Aunt Jean fully believed that she would go to heaven. She also fully believed that one day my Uncle Bob would wake up and Aunt Jean would be gone, and she would be in paradise. Okay? But that's not the point of this text. The point of this text is Jesus is telling his disciples, these four disciples who are like all of us, he's telling these four disciples, look, things are bad. And he was both describing a future event and things that had already happened. He was telling them, look, things are bad, but you need to wait. And now we say to ourselves, wait, that's the hardest thing to do in all of life. Waiting, it's the hardest thing to do. But you know, the Hebrew word for wait has nothing to do with sitting still. The Hebrew word for wait is about action. When we are waiting for whatever that may be, Jesus is calling us to take action. Jesus is calling us in the midst of this despair and destruction and pain and war and suffering to do something about it. That is how the Israelites understood the word wait. And it is also how Jesus understood the word hope. You see, hope is one of the things that happens to a person when they enter into the mind of Christ. That's our very John Wesley understanding of grace growing in the mind of Christ, and one of the attributes of that is a hope that's a power. It's what keeps us going. And I'm going to tell you two stories today about how that keeps us going. Two stories of pastors, all right? A pastor colleague of mine, a pastor colleague of mine works in a shelter works in a shelter for homeless individuals. And it's in an area of a major city that is famous for <coughs> drug abuse, all forms of addiction, all forms of homelessness. And the, the city does not know how to deal with it. It is also one of the most violent areas of this entire city, perhaps one of the most violent communities in the entire United States. And, and his task there is to provide a shelter so that people have a respite, can have food perhaps a shower. They come and go. Often, as he said, you don't even know their real name. Many are in trouble with the law, so they won't give you their real name, but the, the shelter welcomes them and invites them in. But yet he continues to do this. And he wrote this email to me several years ago, and I'm, I'm not going to read it verbatim. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it said. And he said, you know, I am struggling a lot on this <laughs> evening. It is 3.30 in the morning, and I am at the county hospital once again. One of the people at the shelter has been shot. I'm sitting in a waiting room with people and other family members whose relatives and friends and kids have been shot. 
or stabbed or brought in because they were so they were so addicted or alcoholic that they were brought in off the street and I'm sitting there with this artificial light listening to people try to talk and try to pretend everything is going to be good and he said I feel like I am ready to give this up this is a hopeless congregation this is a hopeless community this uh, these are people who just despair and that's the way they look at life all they care about is is where the next hit is going to come from all they care about all they care about is, is how are they going to get that little money they need just to somehow survive. They don't care about God. They don't care about faith. But then he said, even in the midst of this, as I'm sitting in the waiting room at a hospital emergency room, as I'm waiting for them to walk out the door and tell me that the person I'm here for has died, which inevitably they will, I feel more compelled in my ministry than I ever have been because I feel that it is hope as a power that allows me to do this. If I did not hope that in some life or in several <laughs> lives, God's grace doesn't touch them, why would I do this? If I did not hope that there was a possibility that this person could find peace, could find hope, could find companionship, why would I possibly do this? And he said, that's the power of hope. And he wrote me that email right before Advent because we'd been talking about how hard it is to preach hope and joy and peace and love at a time when the world seems torn apart. He wrote it to say that above all else, above all else, hope can be a power. And if we ever think that what we are doing is in vain, if we ever think that we are, are serving in vain, if we ever think that we are reaching out to help people in vain, what keeps us going? Hope. How many times have I walked into dealing with someone who's suffering in some way? What allows them to keep going? It is hope. Not false hope, but a power of hope. It is the power of hope that touches every life. It's the power of hope that allows us to walk through the brokenness of life. It's the power of hope that allows us to keep going. And now I'm going to tell you a second story about a second pastor. And again, I will not read this letter verbatim, but I'm going first set the scene about it. This individual was a person who was engaged in mission. And he had just returned from a very unsuccessful mission trip. Very unsuccessful. And those happen even in our world today of, of missionary activities. They happen. He was frustrated. At the same time, his marriage was falling apart. Terrible marital problems. His colleague in ministry, a person who had worked closely with him, told him he wanted to back away. He wanted to concentrate on other things in his life, in his career. And the church in which he was ordained was starting to reject him. They were telling him that they were unhappy with his ministry. If you will, his pastor evaluation was not good. That was the, that was the picture. And he wrote these words to his dear friend. He said, you know, I'm starting to wonder if I still believe in God. I just don't feel God's judgment on me. I'm not sure that I ever could say I really loved God. I'm not sure that I ever really 